Good morning. It is great to be home. Carol and I had two weeks uh, in the, the big states, or the smaller big states. When you grow up in Virginia, I spent all of my growing up days in southern Virginia, when you get out west, the states out there are like four times the size of what you thought was a pretty good size uh, piece of ground. So uh, the Dakotas and Montana and Washington and Wyoming, they all, to an eastern guy, seem pretty big, but of course, ah, we live in the great one, right? What a joy to be together. I hope your joy is being built on today. I know there's pain in your, in your lives. I know that there's struggles in your days. I know that there are, there are hurts and there are losses. I know that there are uh, relationships that need healing. I know that there are diseases that are attacking our lives, but yet God calls us to rejoice always. And that's not based on any temporary issue that we have or don't have. I can be happy when my day is untroubled and I'm irritated and sad when my day is messed up. No, that's not the way he works. He calls us to rejoicing based on who he is. He doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. And our rejoices, rejoicing is entirely based on the fact of God. What his nature is like, what his character is like, what his wonderful uh, infinity is like, how every part of him is holy and he's driven by goodness and everything goes through his filter of love. So much so it defines him. God is love. What a God. Thank you for your patience this morning. Scott, sorry the slides weren't cooperating with you. Um, I, uh, I had the same problem when I was speaking in, um, in, in North Dakota. In fact, Carol and I got to, got to grow closer to three different congregations on our trip, two in North Dakota and one in Washington, uh, and uh, bring you love and greetings from them. But uh, their, their, their uh, slide advancer was very slow at responding, so you'd click it and nothing would happen. You'd keep teaching and nothing would change, so you'd click it again, and then nothing changed, you'd click it again. And by the time it started changing, you jumped 10 slides ahead. It's like, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. And then if you try to jump back, it wouldn't respond, you know. So uh, a joy, and, uh, um, and, and, and you, say, you just set those off as so inconsequential, it hardly matters. It hardly matters. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy God, your glory, your holiness, your greatness, your love, your care for our lives, your complete knowledge of us is so humbling, Father. Please help us to be uh, submissive to you, to be hungry for your word, to be de devoted to one another, to, to uh, want to be more like your son every day and to wake up looking for opportunities to do that. Thank you, Father, for this time, and we pray that uh, in your word uh, we find growth and maturity and a greater knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm joining Mike, or Mike and I are joining together, I should say, in the letters to the seven churches in Asia. So we're going to be in Revelation uh, chapter 2 on the third letter, written to the angel of the church of Pergamum. Now, many of the other letters are written to congregations we know other things about from the scriptures. But Pergamum uh, has very little comment. So basically, this is the only place we know that that congregation existed outside of history. We have historical connections, and we'll show, show you some of those. To the angel of the church of Pergamum. Jesus has a very interesting uh, style to these letters. These seven letters are coming straight from our Lord. Not that there's a real difference between, uh, between the, the inspiration that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul and Peter and, and John, these writers. John here is writing. 
Uh, but this is the words of Jesus, not the words of Peter guided by the Holy Spirit. These are the words of Jesus to his church. Remember he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Death will not be victorious over his church. Sin will not be victorious over his church. And his church will get built and his church will accomplish what he intended it. And we sure have messed it up. If you look at the 2,000 years since, since uh, these uh, letters were written and the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of divisions that we have put into churches, it's embarrassing. Imagine if anything else was given to us and we were responsible for it. Imagine if somebody said, would you house it for me? And they came back and the garage was in the backyard and the, uh, and the roof was in the front yard and, the, and the, the dining room was flooded and the bedroom has burnt down and the bathrooms were all uh, non-functional and, 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 and. You'd say, what did you do? Hey, your mailbox is fine. Your mailbox is doing, I mean, we have, humans have so uh, damaged the pattern that God gave us to follow in his word as to what his church was supposed to be, what it was supposed to do, and the way it was supposed to walk. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to look back at God and to look at his church in this world. You can't, it's not even recognizable in all the divisions. And, and we have to shrug our shoulders because he's the only one who can untangle it. we try to untangle it, we'll cause more divisions. So we just say, your word only, Father, just your word. We just want to follow your word. I don't know much else, but I know this is yours. So that's where we are. The, so these letters give us a, a real connection, a real blessing in seeing and understanding what God wanted and, and how he wanted to communicate with his churches. We read, including what we talked about last week with Mike, the, church, the, the message to the church in Smyrna, and I did that on purpose, of course, because there are so many parallels in this structure. Jesus gives us a particular structure or a pattern, and the pattern is like this. Every letter has almost all of these elements. There are two letters that have no rebuke in them. And that's astounding. When you imagine uh, it's Smyrna and Philadelphia, there's no rebuke in the letter. Imagine that. Imagine a church today not being rebuked by Christ. Yeah, somebody over here said, wow, that's, a stu that's stunning. When I look at my own faults and my own weaknesses, my own struggles and my own shallowness and and I think, wow, obviously that involves the great amount of grace that Lauren talked about. And he had a particular point uh, for these corrections. To the angel of the church. Now, the word angel in the New Testament or in the Bible means messenger. It means messenger. So if I gave you a message and asked you to deliver it across the valley, you would be an angel. I'd say, oh, what an angel you are for doing this for me. And you'd say, well, I'm not that good. And no, no, you're an angel. You're a messenger. And we'd go back and forth until we finally started defining things. So Mike brought up the idea that the angel of the church, for any one of these congregations, is the one who brings the message, the preacher. And that's a completely normal and a frequent uh, interpretation of this, and I think could be absolutely correct. But the other bunches of times in the New Testament where the word angel is used, almost always it's used as a messenger of God. It's used as an angel, as God's messenger, mighty and able to move in a thing called flight, and armed with sword and, uh, and serving the needs of the saints, as Hebrew teaches us. They're ministers. Angels are ministering spirits that serve you. 
you have an angel. It doesn't mean you have your own angel, but you have angels from God serving you. When it talks about children, it talks about them having their own angel. I don't know if you lose your child when you get to be a grumpy adult or not. I mean, lose your angel when you get to be a grumpy adult. But, uh, but at least children are described in Scripture as having angels watching out over them. And there are many, 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 many angels. Uncountable. So, an alternative aspect to the angel of the church of Thyatira or Ephesus or Pergamum could be that there's an angel of the church of Wasilla or the valley. Somebody asked the other day in a Bible study, how many angels are in this room with us? So I ask you, how many angels are in this room with us? Fascinating thought. They respond to you. They serve you. They deliver things to you. They protect you. They're involved in warfare in response to your prayers. It's astounding what we have. And we might, by these words, have our own devoted valley congregation angel. Sitting in this room, they're, they're not uh, omnipresent like God is. They are, they are located like we are in a particular place. So it's fascinating to imagine the angel of God's congregations. And then Jesus does something else that's interesting here. He gives his own response, just like the letters of the New Testament where you say who the letter is to and then who it's from. You don't put the from at the bottom of the letter. You make the person go all the way to the end to see who wrote it. Jesus identifies himself, but all seven identifications of himself are different. Today's identification is the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. And as you look back at the patterns of, his, of them, you find his identification deals particularly with the problem he's writing about. When he says, I'm, I have eyes like a flame of fire, he's identifying his awareness, his knowledge, what he sees, what he knows, and what he's able to judge. So Jesus describes himself immediately in each one of these letters with a totally different but totally divine description of our Lord. The third thing he says is, I know. I know. I know your deeds. I know your tribulation. To Pergamum, he says, I know where you live. Now, if I had walked up to you after being gone for two weeks and I'd said to you, I know your deeds. I know what you've been doing while I've been gone. You'd go, you might know one or two things I've done while you were gone, but I had 14, 24-hour days. You don't know what I've been doing, Robert. And you'd be absolutely correct. But when Jesus says, I know your deeds, he knows your deeds. And, there's, and, and we find no reason to have a different perspective of Christ to the church in Pergamum or Thyatira or Ephesus or Laodicea than he does to the church in the valley. That he could easily stand and maybe in, 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 our, in answer to our prayers absolutely does say, I know you. I know. I know your deeds. And in fact, we know that God knows our deeds because he tells us he does. He knows our deeds. He knows our thoughts. Hebrews 4.12 says specifically that God judges the thoughts and intentions of our heart. He knows them and he judges them. Now, I don't know all my thoughts, but I can probably get close to my thoughts. But God knows my intentions. And I get all stumbled up trying to figure out my own intentions. The fact that God says, Robert, I know your intentions. I know the intentions of your heart is one of the many things he tells us about ourselves that we don't even know ourselves. And that's a big one. He tells us he knows how many hairs are on our head. And that's a flippant one. That's pretty, pretty minuscule. But he says that to us so, he real, so that we realize how specific and accurate and necessary are, is God's knowledge of us. So when Jesus says to the churches, I know you. 
I know your deeds, I know your tribulation, I know where you live, and I know what's going on with every person in the vicinity of where you live. That's, in, that's exciting and humbling simultaneously, but it gets, up to sit, it gets us to sit up and take notice of these letters. He says, and then says next in every one of these letters what the situation is. He lists the right, he lists the good things they're doing first. Interesting. That's a counseling technique. Tell somebody their good points first, and then you tell them where they need to grow. Jesus does that to every one of the congregation where he has a rebuke. He, as I said, he doesn't always have a rebuke. And then he makes a correction. He lists their mistake and then corrects it and tells them what they need to do to fix their mistake. He doesn't just leave them hanging, but he's specific about his correction. And then he has a common ending <clears throat> done one way or the other. He says, don't ever quit or... Uh, faithful until death, I will give you a crown of life, which is, which is uh, a beautiful uh, admonition for us, but we can take it to heart as don't ever quit, don't ever give up, don't ever stop. Faithful until death, he says to the church uh, in Smyrna. And then he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death which is another way of saying, don't leave me, and the judgment will pass you over. There'll be no second death. And then challenges everybody, and I love this. Do you have ears? Do you have ears? Isn't that interesting? Do you have ears? Then use them, is what Jesus says. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, and that's such a, a, such a statement of responsibility. He puts right into our hands the responsibility for the information. It's not unlike uh, the, the, the way our laws work in this country. If you... Uh, broke a law of the state of Alaska, and you told the judge, I had no idea that that was a law. I didn't know I couldn't set my neighbor's barn on fire. I had no idea. They would say ignorance of the law is no excuse and find you guilty of violating the law. Even if there was something obscure that you had no reason to have known about, you're still responsible before the state for everything you do in violation to its will. And so it is with Jesus. He, he tells us, each one of us, I'm giving you this information, you listen. So, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, whether that be the preacher or the one that's sitting on the roof of the church uh, building where they meet, the the godly angel, the spiritual angel. First of all, a little bit about Pergamum so we can understand some of this. Uh, this is a, a, a map of Asia Minor. So when it says the churches, the seven churches of Asia, they're all in Asia Minor. In, this is the present day Turkey, and they're all in, in eastern Turkey. Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Ephesus, and Smyrna. All seven of them are right there in, in a, what we would consider a fairly small area in, in western Turkey. Turkey or Asia Minor as it was before modern and there is Pergamum right by the coast and there is what Pergamum looks like today from the air. That's the ruins of the, the ancient city of Pergamum. Prominent in that is the amphitheater, huge amphitheater with amazing acoustics. It would fit thousands upon thousands of people. Somebody estimated 10,000 people could sit. It is way up in the air. It's on a mountaintop, 1,000 feet, more than 1,000 feet, almost 1,100 feet above the Aegean Sea. And that's a bay of the sea in the background. And on the top are the remnants of the temples that used to be on the top of Pergamum. Here's a close-up of one of the temples, uh, and that doesn't do us a lot of good. So here's a model of what the city top would have looked like, what the city looked like in those days when this letter was written to the church in Pergamum. This is what they were dealing with. And on top of this uh, is, there's the amphitheater, and you have uh, 
three huge temples. The temples, the one on the left, or on your right, uh, is the temple to Zeus. In fact, it has a huge uh, altar to bring sacrifices to the god of the, the king of the gods, the head of all the gods, Zeus. On the other side, I'm pretty sure this is the, uh, uh, the temple. It's hard to figure out in all their pictures which is exactly which, but that's the temple to Athena, the god of, goddess of wisdom. And in the middle, elsewhere they, they have up there, is a temple to the Roman emperor, the god emperor of Rome. And so they, they would give their homage to, to the Roman emperor. Uh, Pergamum, unlike many of the cities that Rome conquered, Pergamum became a Roman-run city. They have their own Roman, they, this is a, the, the uh, governing central for that in, entire region of Asia Minor, first of all, and it's run by a Roman-placed uh, 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 position. It, other places, uh, they allowed the local authorities to run their own cities. Rome would allow somebody to run their own areas if they'd be peaceful about it. Well, Pergamum is deliberately run by Rome itself, and so homage to the, to the Roman emperor was more of a, of a built-in thing here. Pergamum is pretty famous today in the archaeological circles because of what was saved. In the 1880s, German archaeologists went and picked up the Temple of Zeus, stone by stone, and carried it back to Germany. There it is in Berlin in the museum. This was built, put in the museum in the eight, in 1930s, um, and uh, Isaac was bicycling past the front of this, um, and uh, uh, it, it was too close to closing time, so he was in Berlin this May trying to get over to catch up with us in southern Germany, and uh, did not get to go in, and I just hurt for him. Oh, my goodness. It's an amazing thing to see. When you see the scope and the size of this thing, they carried that stone by stone from Asia Minor to Central Europe and, re -put, and put it back together, including many other things that we won't get into in this museum. It is an amazing museum connecting in one room after another room after another room to biblical facts. So that's the front of, of the Temple of Zeus. Here's a model of the Temple of Zeus. And I'm showing you this much detail because I want you to see and to be aware of when Jesus says where Satan sits or where Satan has his throne that, you're, that we're paying attention to what the Christians there would have been seeing. Now, it's hard to know um, how Jesus meant that. But the temples there were so powerful and so overwhelming to the city itself, even uh, Zeus's temple, looking like a place where a, a Satan-sized being could sit. Satan is spirit and doesn't need any room to sit anywhere. But Jesus says this was his throne. Um, and you can see all the, all the other gods uh, along the side of the, uh, of the temple of Zeus and the majesty of the temple itself, a humankind trying to make something look really uh, significant. Um, Jesus came with this, uh, uh, this message to the church in, in Pergamum with the identity of saying, I am the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. The one who has the sharp, sharp two-edged sword says this. So he introduces his letter with his own title of one who speaks with a sword. And we know that Revelation describes Christ as one who has a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. The word of God, of course, identified in Ephesians 6, is the sword uh, from the Spirit that we get to use, the sword of the Spirit, that we get to participate in Jesus' own words by being able to teach them, use them, follow them. They cut both ways. They convict of sin and they heal. However you want to describe cutting both directions, they can, they can challenge the, the, the most devoted, longest Christian that's, that's alive today and the brand new Christian as well. Uh, the the double-edged sword means it's completely effective, completely sharp, 
completely accurate and able to do whatever job is in front of it. And Jesus is specifically challenging the church in Pergamum eventually for some of, the, of what they're doing with his words. As we said, Jesus says, I know. And here he says, I know where you dwell. And you can take it to heart that Jesus knows the details of your life. You're in pain. Relationship is broken down. Your job's not going well. Your money's not going well. Your health's not going well. Your loved one's health isn't going well. Whatever it is, Jesus knows. He knows what you're going through. And he doesn't just empathetically imagine it like one of us does. But when he says he knows, I know he knows. And that's very personal. When Psalms 139 says he knows how many times we stand up and how many times we sit down in, today, in the day. And when Jesus teaches himself that, that uh, not a sparrow falls to the ground, not one little bird falls to the ground apart from the knowledge of God. And of course, as we've said already, the very hairs of your head are numbered, that the details, the, the deep details of your life are completely known by God. And he knows. He knows your suffering. He knows your need of encouragement. He knows your need of rebuke. He knows everything about you. He knows where you're hurting. And he's there to give you strength to put up with it. You live, he tells them, where Satan sits. Now, I give you this photograph again because you can imagine how many places somebody might read that sentence and look at the city of Pergamum and imagine Satan sitting down somewhere. Maybe he's got his legs hung over the edge of that hill and he's looking down at the sea, which is a connection to the rest of the world. Maybe he's sitting on one of those temples, either the one for Athena of, of false, ungodly wisdom or the wonderful one of Zeus, which is not there because it's been taken away, uh, which is a place is supposedly the king of the gods. Or maybe he'd sit with his back in that amphitheater. I've heard preachers today talk about how much Satan must spend time in, in Hollywood so that he can get false and ugly and nasty and lousy messages spread out efficiently around the world through movies and, and other garbage that they produce. Where does Satan sit today? I have no idea, and I wouldn't pretend to know. But Jesus says he was sitting in Pergamum. Now, these are real places with real churches, with real needs in a real time. Much of, of, uh, of, of Revelation is figurative, but these are at least accurate in the physical and the spiritual needs of those churches in those cities. This wasn't a, fir, uh, a figurative set of letters. Satan sitting anywhere is figurative, but at least, since Satan is not omnipresent, at least Jesus acknowledges that Satan spent time here. Either in his representative uh, pressure through the government, the ugliness of the government, and we have a point where, where that's, that's established here, or with his effect through the falseness of empty and and non-existent gods. Whatever it is, Jesus is telling the church, you're in a dangerous place, and then he says, but you've been faithful to me. But you were faithful. Listen to this. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you know, hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who is killed among you where Satan lives. Twice we're told that Satan is there. And then we're told about our brother Antipas. Now, historically, um, in, in church history, he's called a, a bishop. And as soon as you hear somebody, especially this early, first century stuff, called a bishop, you know he's an elder. He's an elder. Later on, bishops were confused with other things, but early on, bishops were elders. Shepherds were elders. Pastors were elders. Elders were elders, etc., etc. So this man was an elder. So this could have been an elder of the church in Pergamum, 
who would not for the sake of his faith, who would not because of the truth of Christ, who would not because of his challenge and faithfulness deny Jesus as Lord. To, 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 to worship at the emperor's temple that we just saw uh, in Pergamum, you would have said Caesar is Lord. And certainly that's the challenge that was given to Antipas. All you have to say is Caesar is Lord. Maybe Caesar is divine. You can keep your own gods. You just have to acknowledge the godship of Caesar and you're free to go. And like many Christians in persecution, he would not do that. And he was killed for it. So the Satan sitting there could have been that brutal authority of the government. Whether it was uh, the, the, the godlessness of the, of the temples, whether that was the authority of the government there to, to murder innocent men and women because of their faith, or whether it was the, the blatancy of, the, of sin in most Greek cities, Roman cities in that day. Whatever it was, Satan was sitting there. We do not have the exact uh, reason that Jesus said it that way, but any of those is plenty. So he praises them for Antipas and for all of them being faithful in the faith. But, verse 14, but, ouch, oh Jesus, okay, go ahead. But I have this against you because there are some who hold the teachings of Balaam who, keep teach, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you have some who in the same way hold the te to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Jesus says you have people who are acting like Balaam, and who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now, one of the interesting things about that is that that message is given to the body. You are putting up with people who are teaching falsely or, or being divisive or bringing sin into people's lives or all of it. And so he puts on the church the responsibility to police themselves. And that requires us to know each other, to be close to each other, that before somebody uh, is, is able to, to walk down the road of a misunderstanding of Scripture or of something that would be uh, against God's teaching or God's word, he, he, it requires that we are close and trusting and, and, and connected and involved in each other's lives, for none of us want something taught that's against God's will. Basically, the, the, between Balaam and what he did with Balak, according to Numbers 22 and Numbers 31 uh, chapters, and uh, what's explained here, and what the Nicolaitans did, and the Nicolaitans were basically a, a subset of the Gnostics, is both of them, ba uh, Balaam, who wouldn't, who wouldn't tell Balak, uh, Barak anything except what God said, kept looking for an opportunity to violate God's will, kept looking for an opportunity to get the money that the king was trying to pay him, kept looking for an opportunity to compromise on the message. I can't tell you anything except what God tells me, but I'll stay along with you until I find another way to help you out. It's, it's this common mistake that we get into sometimes where we want our will done. But we know what God's will is, and it's, we really don't want to violate that. So we just sort of scoot over a little bit more, and then a little bit more. Well, maybe, no, I can't do it yet. I can't do it yet. Well, now I can, well, I can't do it yet, but I can tell this person to get out there and do wrong. I can let somebody else trip up somebody and cause a problem. We, we scooch ourselves closer and closer and closer to the world was what Balaam did to the king in trying to, to uh, give him an advantage over the nation of Israel. Rather than standing more firmly where the Lord speaks, we look for compromise or look for our own will in our lives and try to maneuver or manipulate God's will around it. The Nicolaitans looking to justify 
thinking that, that physical sins, their, their real crime was that physical sins, sexual sins predominant, were really not a problem for God. We can go ahead and be sexually immoral because we're ge- being forgiven anyway, and the body doesn't count for anything because we're spiritually resurrected. So we can do anything we want with our bodies, was what, kind of what the Nicolaitans taught. You can go ahead and be sexually involved in the temple prostitutes or in some guy or lady down the street, and that's not a problem for your faith in Christ. That immorality spoken of there specifically is sexual immorality. And I want to say this quickly and and, uh, not take up too much time, but sexual immorality is the most common sin described and taught against in the New Testament. All sins are discussed, not all sins, all, all the categories of sins are discussed, but sexual immorality 55 times are brought up in words uh, in the New Testament. Over and over and over again, most commonly we're told to be careful with sexual immorality. The other thing described here is idolatry, and that is the love of anything in the world. Do not love the world or the things of the world, uh, John tells us in, John, in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things of the world. And, and what, uh, what Paul writes to the church in, in, in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. No physical uh, need in my life will be my master, he says. And then specifically said food for the stomach. At the end of of verse 13, he says, yet the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members with Christ? Verse 15, I'm in 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For it says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee, verse 18, sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. Very clear, very blunt teaching about not bringing ourselves into sexually tempting, sexually immoral situations of any kind. It's a broad sexual term. It's not just talking about adultery or what happens uh, in bed uh, between two people. In in chapter 7, the very next words out of 1 Corinthians is talking about marriage. As if this is where you stay away from sexual morality. Here's where you participate in sexual blessings. But back to uh, uh, Revelation. So these two things are warned about to the church. And then he tells them, therefore, repent. Repent now, or I'll have to come. And I'll use that two-edged sword. And he, he doesn't explain all how he used it, but he says, I will make war with them by the sword of my mouth. To those who don't listen or, or understand or agree or repent, he has a battle to participate in. It teaches us that repentance is a continual part of our lives. We didn't just repent once when we were baptized. We stay aware of, of, of the word of God, of our own weaknesses, of our own, uh, of our own struggles, and we stay in a, in a mindset. Lord, teach me, show me any, anything in me that is unlike you, and I will repent of it. We stay in a mindset of repentance. And then he says, he who has an ear... He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the church. To him who overcomes, 
To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and, and, and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. We receive God's manna, his hidden new manna, the, the, and, and that, would be, that would be, according to John 6, the bread of Christ, Christ himself. He gives us bread from, from which we will never hunger again. He has new manna for us. So to those who stay faithful, we fill ourselves up with Christ. To those who stay faithful, <clears throat> we're given <clears throat> excuse me, the white stone of sinlessness. We are white, pure, found uh, no sin found in our lives, and we're given a new name. Now, several places in the, in the Bible it talks about a new name, Isaiah 60, 56, Isaiah 62. The, there are several places we're talking about us being given a new name, but this one seems particularly personal because other names like Christian that carry the name of Christ, we all carry, but this name is for the one only who receives it. So what do we do with this letter? We stay faithful. That's the praise he gave to the church. We stay faithful. We follow the word, not the world. We don't, we don't try to make compromise like uh, Balaam and the Nicolaitans did, making compromise, compromise between God's will and what the world wants. We don't, we don't uh, love or follow the world. We follow the word, and we're careful with that. And we never quit. Don't ever, 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 ever quit. No matter how painful, no matter how frustrating, no matter how confused, no matter anything else you could put in that sentence, don't ever quit the Lord. Don't ever quit his church. Don't ever quit his walk. Don't ever quit your faith. Exactly. It's, a, it's a, uh, an issue to weep over. Don't ever quit. If any here this morning have not been baptized into Christ, do you have any need that we can help you with? Uh, we want to do so. Please come forward while we stand and sing the song that Scott has selected for us.